Okay, so I'm very happy to have you, James. Thank you. Oh, well, thanks for inviting me. <laughs> I think, first of all, our listeners would be curious to know how did it start this interest about psychotherapy research and practice, and how did it eventually lead to you being drawn towards psychotherapy integration? Mm -hmm. um, well, I mean, I would say that those two are linked, uh, because I really went into my graduate training at Penn State. Uh, I worked with Louis Castingay, and and his work in integration was one of the main drivers of my, of my interest. And so when I was, you know, when I was in an undergraduate program, uh, I was actually originally a biochemistry major, and was very interested in the scientific process, and, and had every intention to go to medical school, but to primarily be a researcher. And then took a general education and requirement psychology course and, and really fell in love with it and the idea of, um, and it seems obvious now, but really thinking about human behavior and relationships from, from a scientific perspective to try to understand um, the nature of behavior and, and, and how that changes over time or doesn't change. And, um, and you know, through my coursework, I, I also did um, some coursework in philosophy, mm -hmm. you know, thinking, uh, you know, being exposed to different models related to epistemology and, um, and even some philosophy of science and then certainly other models of psychotherapy. And I, and I was fortunate to actually have a, an instructor at my, at my college who, who was pretty open about uh, going through the different models. I think maybe sometimes you run into a trap where somebody might disparage a certain model and, um, uh, I won't go into detail about that, but <laughs> be open. And so, you know, it just really got me thinking that, well, you know, these different approaches, whether it be humanistic, uh, psychodynamic or, or behavioral, um, you know, I, every, it's, it's similar to the, uh, you know, I think what do they call it? The medical school syndrome, where you learn about all of these diseases and you believe that you have them. <laughs> you have a psychology course and you believe that you have that, uh, that disorder. Well, <laughs> read through these different models of therapy and you really think that, well, they are capturing something about the experience that seems, uh, seems, uh, you know, on, on target, mm -hmm. um, you know, whether or not you're focusing on emotional experiencing or, or the function of different behaviors and, uh, unconscious meaning. Mm -hmm. Um, it's, it speaks to, I think, parts of, of, uh, you know, part, parts of sort of humanity and functioning that, that are that are appealing and interesting and uh, have some empirical support behind them, of course. And so, you know, I was really driven by the thought that, uh, well, you know, maybe there's something that's common among these things that really is, is, is the, is the uh, best way to sort of account or explain uh, these phenomenon and change in psychotherapy, you know, or maybe if there aren't these common factors, there, there could be something about these individual models that appeal more to, to particular individuals. So mm -hmm. it gets at some of that personalization, yeah. you know, and so, um, so I've always had an interest in the, in, in the idea of personalization, but then also at a very sort of theoretical level, um, you know, how these different models actually operate and where they, uh, converge or diverge. Uh -huh. you know, so and so, from the beginning, I was very interested in psychotherapy integration and, and, and psychotherapy process research to, to, to study these questions. Yeah. Um, and uh, so that's what you know led me to my graduate training. Yeah. Well, you you mentioned one of your mentors, so Louis Castanway. I'm sure that your interest in philosophy of science had a particular impact also in the way you viewed this uh, model fight that sometimes goes on in our fields. Yes. Was there also any particular book or author that uh, also inspired you in any way uh, towards this path, besides Louis? Uh, well, uh, I mean, I think that the main, the, the main article that comes to mind would be Mar Marv Goldfried's 1980 article mm -hmm. on principles of, of change, which was published in, in American Psychologist. Um, and that's really, you know, I read it, you know, a hundred times, <laughs> uh, was, was really eye opening to me because certainly I wasn't, ex I wasn't exposed to that initially in, in my training prior to coming to graduate school and being in Louise lab and, and, and Mark Goldfried being Louise, Louise own mentor at Stony Brook, um, you know, getting some early exposure to, to that paper and that model of thinking, mm -hmm. um, that, that was really, um, you know, it was really exciting to read that, you know, to think about this, you know, uh, 
this level of abstraction problem. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and it's something that it actually, I, I will admit that, that to this day, I still wrestle with quite a bit. You know, I think I understand it, <laughs> but then I think about it a little bit more and I talk with people and I'm not sure that I totally understand it. Mm -hmm. And I, and I, I actually teach a, um, teach an undergraduate, an advanced undergraduate course on psychotherapy models uh, and research. And uh, we, I actually try to weave in this principles argument in some papers throughout that course. And then I tell students that this is going to seem unapproachable for, at the beginning, but as we continue to talk about it, maybe it'll start to start to make sense and maybe you can help me make more sense. <laughs> but, but I do think that there's something really important at a basic level, uh, not just from a research perspective, but certainly from a clinical perspective and thinking about what are the specific behaviors and interventions that we're engaging in versus these broad theoretical models that we're working from yeah. and sort of how to understand phenomenon and what we think about is important for change. And then that, that level in between around, well, what is, you know, when it comes and it's really more of a dyadic and intra-psychological uh, process in terms of corrective experiences, developing a positive therapeutic relationship, providing feedback. Um, it's, it, it seems like that really is the level where the action's happening, and, and in particularly around uh, psychotherapy integration, where these different models might be, we might be able to actually converge at that level too. And so, um, that, that's certainly an article that sticks out for me, and I continue to cite it pretty liberally. <laughs> I was going to say in the back of my mind, I was thinking of that article because when I read your articles, you always like to yep. put that one in. <laughs> it's yes. a personal yeah. favorite, I can see. It's not a coincidence because <laughs> I, and, and it's not, in, in, I don't know, maybe I'll have to think about it more, but it doesn't feel as though I'm forcing it. It feels like it's very, it's, yeah. it's natural and it's, you know, to bring it into the conversation, yeah. especially when we're talking about integration. And we're talking about about mechanisms yeah. um, and trying to think about the difference between, say, an intervention mechanism versus what we tend to, I think, often think about mechanisms in terms of what's what's happening with within the client that is changing, yeah. um, which is slightly different from whether or not this particular intervention yeah. is correlated with that process. Yeah. But what I think is really interesting about your work is that you really try to focus on different levels of approaching the research. And I know that you're also very big into process research. So, and I will touch on that a little. But before jumping into that, I'd still like to ask you because in this recent paper, you wrote that an integrative approach has and will continue to be the leading edge of psychotherapy research practice and training. And just for our listeners, I think that uh, the idea of psychotherapy integration maybe has changed along the way because mm -hmm. a lot of people before maybe have thought that it's just the integration of different schools of therapy, mm -hmm. but throughout time it seems that we're doing different kinds of integration with different fields. Would you mind mm -hmm. commenting on that? Well, I mean, certainly there are different, um, you know, there are different pathways to, to psychotherapy integration and and, and in my the way that I tend to think about these things is in is is specific to assimilative integration. So so working from a primary framework, but then, you know, as Stan Messer and others have described, sort of bringing in concepts and even technical uh, factors that that are more closely connected to an alternative or exogenous theoretical orientation. Um, and my partly why I. I, I wrote that paper and framed it that way was that I, I think if you step back and you look at the developments in psychotherapy in, in over the past decade, and if you look at, um, or a couple of decades, and if you look at where, say, for example, the National Institute of Mental Health is going in the United States with its focus on these, these RDOC categories and systems, moving away from a transdiagnostic, uh, excuse me, moving toward a transdiagnostic uh, way of thinking about uh, problems that it's, it, it's, it's offering a way to think about these things at that abstract level or that in intermediate level that I mentioned, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. And so this actually links back to what I was mentioning before is that, is that these, these processes are just by their nature often cutting across different theoretical models. Yeah. Uh, now, now, the more we learn about these processes, whether it be interpersonal systems, uh, affective systems, 
biological systems, of course, these things are, you know, they're all related dynamically, but if we sort of divide these things up, right, um, that we really are talking about an intermediate level of abstraction that it would be hard to find somebody who even primarily identifies with, say, a psychodynamic orientation or, or a process experiential orientation or a behavioral orientation. Uh, it, it's most people when they when when they're asked about it, I think, when, yeah, that makes sense to me, and I can see where we can actually have a conversation around those things. And something else that you that that that, that seems apparent to me is that um, you know if you take for example uh, cognitive behavioral therapy, and so and so I even though I'm very much an integrationist, my my primary framework for thinking about things is, is cognitive behavioral, and and a lot of the research that I that I've done has been specifically in, in cognitive behavioral therapy or some version of cognitive behavioral therapy that integrates some other component mm -hmm. uh, with an emotion focused component or interpersonal component. So it, if you look at where CBT models, you know, how they've evolved, and then you look at these quote unquote third wave therapies, mm -hmm. um, dialectical behavior therapy, acceptance commitment therapy, <clears throat> It's pretty striking that the, we're really talking about integrative therapies, mm -hmm. you know. And you could make an argument that these are assimilative therapies, um, that they're working primarily from a CBT perspective, but they're integrating, um, whether it be mindfulness or emotion-focused theory and interventions, um, you know, a number of other things. Uh, certainly, there are psychodynamic components to a lot of the thing, a lot of these uh, treatments too. But I, I just think that the, as the research has accumulated and these treatments have, have developed, I think we've almost by default ended up with you know the state of the art being integrative treatments. Yeah. And and I don't think that it's a coincidence that at the same time uh, the the focus of, of the research and, and funding climate is really moving toward these. Uh, systems and factors that cut across uh, different different levels of functioning, yeah. uh, aspects of functioning um, that that you know for for many many decades were tend, tended to be you know ascribed to one particular model, mm -hmm. and I think those 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 barriers are being broken down. And so you know I think it's a it's a it's a more of a professional conceptual question. You know are, are people for whatever or political question. You know are are people um, open to ha calling these things what they are, you know, <laughs> integrative therapy and, and, and what precisely are we integrating, you know, or for whatever reason, there, there's some uh, um, aversion to, to, to calling it what it is. There, there may be some political factor in that. But, yeah. um, but I think if you look at, if you just look at objectively what's happening in the field, I, I think that it's pretty clear that, that we're, we're talking about integration, whether or not we label it that way. Yeah, you touched on the topic of transdiagnostic, and I'd still like to ask you also about that because you have, for a long time in your career, I think, released some papers also on this. Uh, you did a, the paper on uh, intolerance of uncertainty as a common target, uh, transdiagnostic target, and transdiagnostic CBT. And I was wondering if, um, if you think that this transdiagnostic research and their findings, if they just add to our knowledge of psychopathology, for instance, or if they in a way put question marks on the validity of some of our models, because if some of these targets actually are transdiagnostic in a way, then it could indicate that some of our categories are... I don't know what good word to use it, but can you understand right. my question? Yeah. Yeah, and I think this is a, this is an ongoing you know debate. debate, and it's an it's a good one, you know, um, because I you know even though I've you know been doing some work on transdiagnostic therapy and, and one particular type of transdiagnostic therapy, the unified protocol, which speaks to me because I you know it is it is broadly CBT based, but also I would say that my just naturally, I gravitate toward an emotion-focused orientation. That would be kind of my my A sub A or B, <laughs> and so it's 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 emotion-focused. Um, you know, in the same way that that many have argued that uh, you know, really the working with emotion and and emotion science is is one of the bridges that that's really critical. I know Les Greenberg and Mark Goldfried has written, have written about this. You know, that that can be a pretty key bridge across the different models that we have. Mm -hmm. uh, I, so I, you know, if you look at the literature, um, and it's of course always always evolving and somewhat mixed, but um, 
to, to say that, that a trans diagnostic approach is, is useful or, or providing, um, you know, important incremental information about psychopathology and treatment is, is not to disregard that, that there, that there are some pretty important differences among, um, problem area systems, whatever that might be. Mm -hmm. So, so to say that, um, there are some constructs and, and mechanisms that, that are similar or converge, um, between say anxiety and mood disorders as, as currently defined in say the DSM, you know, it's not to say that there may not be some, you know, certain things that are unique about, about say major depressive disorder compared yeah. to panic disorder. Uh, and so, you know, I think that's important to just be clear <laughs> on is that, is that you're more, it's not dismissing that there, there may be some pretty critical differences that will have real implications for uh, treatment, sure. for example. Uh, but, you know, from, from, a, from, a, from a therapy and sort of, uh, you know, from, a, from an understanding how change takes place, you know, uh, perspective, you know, if it is the case that these, um, you know, going back to the RDOC in some ways, these systems or these constructs do appear to cut across these traditional DSM categories, you start to have to wonder what what really is the usefulness, mm -hmm. you know, of, of these. If, if if these constructs and these systems themselves become to define the problem, yeah. you know, then then these fine grained uh, categories, this categorical system, starts to be less useful. So so I tend to be a pragmatist. Mm -hmm. You know, I want to look at the evidence, but I'm also a pragmatist and think through well, well, what. You know, if for uncertainty, for example, and, and, and I like these uh, and, and you know, just like common factors, depending on what you read, there could be a list that identifies 10 of these factors or you could see a list that has 100 factors. So, so whether or not something is transdiagnostic, you know, uh, there are a lot of different constructs out there that uh -huh. transdiagnostic. But it is kind of going back to uh, the future in some ways. You know, it, it's, it's, um, it's identifying, you know, um, Psychological experiences, constructs, uh, you know, behavioral patterns, and 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 targeting those in therapy rather than targeting s symptoms. Yeah. You know, so if you think about well, um, you know, if you have somebody who comes in with primary panic disorder, wants help with their panic, but they also experience low mood from time to time, they also engage in, in a fair bit of excessive worry. These things tend to co-occur at a high level. Mm -hmm. um, if if I'm approaching the problem as, as, as a, as panic disorder primarily, you know, and thinking about, well, you know, if I was to tell myself or a supervisee, you know, the goal in this treatment, given the panic is that you really want to target those panic symptoms. So, so this treatment is all about reducing panic levels, reducing anxiety levels. And so go, go do that. <laughs> Not very helpful, but if, but if I can say, well, you know, we, we have the panic, attacks are the primary problem. You know, we do need to address those, but we also have issues related to mood. We also have issues related to this unproductive ruminative process. You know, what are some factors that cut across those things? Well, we look at something like anxiety sensitivity. So there are a number of interventions we might use to address anxiety sensitivity, which tends to be elevated for people with panic, but we've also found that it's elevated in, in other anxiety disorders and also eating disorders and, and, and smoking, et cetera. Um, and so we can actually work around how to address anxiety sensitivity. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. And if we address that, then if it has some sort of a linchpin uh, <laughs> effect, then, then it should also be uh, having some impact on the worry processing and, and, and even mood to a certain extent. Um, and so, you know, I, I, there's the, there's the nosology problem that I think many people, you know, uh, you know, are aware of and, and, and have been critical of, of this, this excessive parsing, you know? And so to say that something is transdiagnostic doesn't, doesn't mean that there are important differences, yeah. but it's it's clear that there there are potentially better ways of of thinking about functioning and dysfunction, yeah. and for me they make much more sense clinically, uh -huh. and, and and so as a clinician I find it very useful to move away from those um, those those sort of hair splitting distinctions uh -huh. and think about things more dimensionally and thinking about them more at that system or, or, or construct level. Um, because it just seems more intuitive to me. 
and 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 my hunch is that it's also um, they don't have a lot of data to show this, but my hunch is that uh, it's also experienced by the client as being uh, much more validating. Mm -hmm. I, I think that uh, you know there's something about the rationale that this is a symptom problem. It's defined in this particular way. We're applying this label versus the, the person as a whole yeah. and sort of thinking about how we respond to our emotions and whether or not that's that's helping us or getting in the way mm -hmm. and how that's connected to rumination and yeah. how that's connected to behavioral avoidance. Mm -hmm. it, it's much more experience near, um, like I said, I don't have any data to show that it's experienced as more validating by the client, but I, but I have a hunch that it might be. It's an interesting hypothesis, this idea that uh, maybe talking about processes in, is inherently felt as more nicer, in a way, more validating than talking about disorders, for instance. Right. It's a, it would be a good research study to do in the future also. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> How did your, because when you research, like you said, you do it from a CBT framework, but you even call it sometimes an emotion-focused cognitive behavioral intervention. Yeah. So how did, well, historically, CBT has done a lot of down-regulating of emotions. Yep. And you've also written about how this other tradition, in a way, talks about heightening of emotions. Mm -hmm. I remember even Louis Cassandray and Marv Goffrey doing those studies that they found out in CBT that when you heighten emotion, it was better for outcomes. So yeah. how, how do you deal with this uh, conflict that has been going on within the CBT tradition of upregulating or downregulating emotion? Right, right. Well, I mean, I think that there's a... Um... Sorry, just to, to confirm something. So we're talking here, uh, my... This is a, a trick question in the sense that I'm <laughs> connecting here with the uh, clinical decision-making. Mm -hmm. So... I, I'd like to ask, like, what would be the marker to know what, when to do what, in a way? Oh, interesting. Yeah, I mean, I I think that there's a there's a paradox at the at, at the functioning or pathology level that 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 I think is mirrored at the intervention level too. With that, you know, where um, and in some ways, the this notion that's attached to, to to child or, or youth pathology and treatment around externalizing versus externalizing di disorders and, and sort of are you, um, you know, in terms of dysregulation, you know, is it is it is it overregulation in the sense that you're damping things down, yeah. you know, about things like anxiety and depression typically, you know, or or is there some hyper sort of reactivity, you know, where there's a lot of strong emotion and, and, and part of the problem is actually that, that it's, that it's too intense, uh, and, and leading to strong emotion driven behaviors that, that actually get people into trouble. Right. And so, I mean, I don't think that we can approach this as a, you know, you always want to ramp up the emotion versus you always want to control the emotion. I mean, the paradox is that at some level, we are talking about more adaptively regulating the emotion, which does imply some level of control. Yeah. But but it, what but what is you know what is the best approach for facilitating that in a way that's healthy that enhances flexibility? Yeah. You know, and I really like the, this. Uh, I think more and more people are really honing in on this this notion of flexibility mm -hmm. in responding. And I actually had a had a supervisor when I was in graduate school who really talked about this quite a bit. You know, around that you know people. You tend to be healthier if you tend to be open to your experience and accepting of your experience, and, and the more you can identify yourself as being flexible, yeah. um, you know that that really is psychological health. You know, <laughs> uh -huh. Is flexibility right? Um, and so, yes, I do think that, um, I, and somewhat unintentionally, uh, that for non-exposure, and I'll say I'll put that aside. So, so non-exposure based cognitive therapies, you know, there is the potential in some cases to um, not sufficiently allow for evoking of emotion and not, not fully recognizing that, that this dampening of emotion or suppression, uh, which could be the, from, from worry or, or, or rumination or, or some other behavioral avoidance or substance use, for example, is actually partly what's maintaining the problem. Yeah. Right. And so I, I think that, that the this emergence of integrative therapies like the therapy that, uh, you know, 
uh, Michelle Newman, Tom Borkovic, Louis Cassandre developed this integrative therapy for generalized anxiety disorder, you know, paying attention to the basic psychopathology and treatment uh, research, not throwing the baby out with the bathwater, saying that CBT is, is, is ineffective because, you know, it continues to be, um, you know, one of the more effective interventions, but, but, but to identify that, well, maybe one avenue to improving effectiveness and, and maybe reaching more individuals would be, let's recognize that, that in many cases, this um, standard approach is, is unintentionally dampening that emotional expression and, and maintaining the very process that we're trying to address. Mm -hmm. And so maybe there are some alternative approaches for, um, for, well, for example, let I me mean, stop doing that, <laughs> but, but better ways of, of evoking emotion. And, and it's an empirical question about whether or not that's actually going to be going to be helpful. Um, but um, I mean, you, you're, you're, I, I guess what's tricky about your question and, and, I, and I've, punted a little bit on it, you know, is that, is that it really is going to, to depend. And, um, uh, because as I said before, you know, you, I, 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 I think that rigidity, inflexibility, suppression, dampening in general tend not to be very, very healthy. Mm -hmm. uh, these tend to be things that are associated with a number of, of problem areas, whether they be mood, anxiety disorders, eating disorders, somatic symptom related disorders, whole host of disorders. Um, but, you know, that's not necessarily to say that, that your, you know, uh, that therapy is maximized by always evoking intense emotion. Uh, I mean, I know that, uh, you know, a lot of the work that, that the folks at York have done um, with Les Greenberg, Alberta Post and, and others, you know, looking at emotional processing in emotion-focused therapy for depression and generalized anxiety disorder. What's fascinating about that to me is, is and this is actually a, was a focus of my dissertation, was looking at the, the type and, and degree of emotional arousal, you know, within treatment, um, in this particular case with generalized anxiety disorder. And um, sort of this notion that arousal for arousal's sake uh, that to some degree, maybe it'll explain a certain portion of the variance for, for particular types of clients. Mm -hmm. Uh, but it, it, it's, too somewhat, rigid. it's too rigid. It's somewhat meaningless out of context. Sure. There has to be, you know, cognitive emotional processing. Yeah. There has to be meaning that is somehow evoked in, a, in, in relation to that arousal for it to really, uh, be helpful, you know, and, and actually have an impact on the, on the individual because, you know, so, um, yeah, so, I mean, so, so there needs to be more than just, um, the heightening or dampening, heightening or dampening. Yeah. There's, 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 there's more to it certainly. Um, but I do think that it's a, and I struggled a bit with this clinically is that I think that we, you know, there's a paradox around being over controlled and it's, and it's potential maintenance of emotion dysregulation. And, and we try to provide that rationale, which, which is pretty key in the unified protocol. Uh, you kind of think through that paradox with, with, with the client, but, but even, you know, as a therapist, I, you know, I, I'm trying to say we're increasing flexibility. We want to actually open you up to your experience. We want to work on that. Um, but at the end of the day, aren't we really still talking about control in any way? Controlling. It's you know, a philosophical question, also. <laughs> right. Like trying to achieve non control through another type of control. <laughs> yes. It's exactly. tricky. Well, well, this bridges perfectly with what I have to say my personal favorite contribution from your work, which is the context responsive psychotherapy integration. And one of the answers I think you proposed to this, and now you can show off your emotion focused credentials, is trying to bring the marker guided work into CBT or in transdiagnostic intervention in general. So just just to tease you a little because I know this is the title of one of your one of your papers. Um, how do you think that clinical errors might happen through a lack of con context responsiveness? Uh, well, I mean, um, so uh, a graduate student in my lab, Matteo Bugatti, and I um, you know, recently published a paper in psychotherapy, and they had a special issue on, on errors, uh, clinical errors. And um, 
because of the the work that we've been doing with Mike Constantino, mm -hmm. you know, he's really the person who's developed fully developed this model and way of thinking about things, and, and and it's very exciting to me, and sort of invited me along for the ride. And so so we've been thinking about, you know, I know he's been thinking a lot about, you know, how do we. Uh, not just in terms of thinking about our psychotherapy process research, but also training and training research. Yeah. You know, how do we actually start to apply and think about the, think about this model? You know, and so I mean, I think it really, and, and I'm sure this has come up in every single interview you've done. <laughs> you know, is that it really boils down to to responsiveness. You know, sure. and, and so I mean, I think that. Um, you know, there are any number of markers that we might identify in, 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 a, in a session. Um, and it, it's really tricky to know, you know, without more data, uh, whether or not in, in your particular response in that moment is going to be problematic. You know, as we, as we were going through this case, for example, that we, that we published uh, in, in for this special series, it's and, and I have to say it takes a, takes a lot of guts, you know, for somebody to write this up. You know, to <laughs> how I you know I made some mistakes, and and I think that it's helpful to realize that we all make these sorts of mistakes, and 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 so, you know, obviously we need more research on these markers, but I think it's 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 you're creating recreating this this narrative in hindsight in a way. You know, by when you're going back into your sessions, and this is why I think it's so important to record your sessions, uh -huh. in addition to collecting some some routine data, you know, and and you can trace back sort of oh, like when when the person uh, started sharing that that story about their interaction with their parents, you know, and and I was because I'm a good little supervisee, you know, I was so. You know, I, I had a plan going into the session, and I, I knew that we needed to get to practice this particular mindfulness exercise. So I cut him off. But I really just, and, and I thought that I was doing a pretty good job because I, I was listening, I was attentive, <laughs> I was nodding. Uh, <laughs> you know, and, and I invited you know the person to say a little bit more, but it seemed like maybe they wanted to, but it was enough of a, you know, they gave enough of a green light for me to keep going on, and, and they did initially agree to this treatment plan. So this is collaborative, right? You know, but, but you look back and you think, that, well, you know, there I, I missed something there. Like maybe that was a time to just sit with the client. Yeah. You know, maybe I need maybe the right move would have been to do nothing. Yeah. You know, to, to to sit there and be with the person and let them naturally, you know, continue on with. Uh, sort of describing or connecting with what they're experiencing, mm -hmm. um, and so I mean I, I think that these 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 non-responsive errors happen all the time, and I think at a certain level they're probably unavoidable, um, and um, uh, and yeah, so they, they, I mean they can come up in, in in any sort of shape, size, flavor. Yeah, uh, and I like what you said about the. You know the emphasis of trying to record ourselves. To be honest, because mm -hmm. this real, it's again your process uh, methodology comes up here. But it's true that in hindsight we really don't know a lot of what's happening. So that would be a shout out for us all to try to bring our tapes whenever possible. Right. I mean, I think that some, uh, you know, and my my again my hunch, you know, is that um, you know there are some there's some basic interpersonal skill, you know, in addition to, to knowledge that people are bringing in to the, to the clinical encounter where you're better positioned and open to noticing these things. Mm -hmm. And so I think that over time, as we learn more and, and we consult more and think more and, and get a bigger uh, sample of our own clients or supervisees clients, uh, then we start to notice these patterns. You know, and hopefully we can study them rigorously, but but there's also a wealth of clinical observation to bring to this, right? And so so I think that we can, through various methods, you know, come up with a way to uh, better prospectively or in the moment identify these things. Yeah. Um, but I think even the best therapists will will miss things. Yeah. You know, and and so I, I think that it's bound to happen. I think we can we can enhance responsiveness. But but I think responsiveness always has this just uh, there, there's a there's a logical problem with it in the sense that it, it's it can be difficult to tease apart process from outcome at a given moment you know because because as a as a supervisor or as a trainer as a researcher 
Um, I would like to be able to watch a session that my supervisee is, is having and, and see, like, wow, it seems like they're really, I think they've done a nice job here. You know, I think that they're really, this is collaborative. They're, they're experiencing with the client. They're delivering things in a skillful way. It seems like this is, a, this is a good interaction. This seems to be very helpful. Uh, but then you might probe the client at the end of the session and ask, you know, how helpful was this session or how did you, what was, what was most important about the session? And they tell you something completely you know, unexpected <laughs> they, that it was horrible. You know? <laughs> And so how do you go back to, well, I mean, I think that the, the therapist was being very responsive. It's like, well, you know, I, I would like to think that there are certain things that we do that sort of just at face value are, are, are good interventions or useful interventions or ways of responding. But at the end of the day, it's all sort of operationalized by, by you know, the client's experience of it. Sure, sure. Um, and so I think it's, I, I absolutely think, and I agree with Mike on this because I know he's mentioned this, is that, is that I, I believe that we can, we can study these, these, these uh, processes. Mm -hmm. I think we can improve our treatments by doing so. Mm -hmm. I think we can become better trainers by doing so. But, but I think it's, it's, it's always going to be a little bit messy. <laughs> and getting back to the uncertainty factor, there's always going to be a little bit of uncertainty. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, but I do think a, you know, this context responsive approach based on markers, similar to the work that they've done in EFT, mm -hmm. you know, I, I, it just makes, again, you know, I'm a pragmatist. It makes a lot of sense clinically mm -hmm. for me. Um, uh, we just have to put in the work to, to, to better identify those, those markers and those patterns. Mm -hmm. um, Changing a little bit, I know that this year the Society for Exploration of Psychotherapy Integration, they're going to have the conference in Denver in May. And I know that you're going to present a paper on therapist effects. Mm -hmm. And I'd be curious if you could give us a sneak peek of what is your own take on this issue. Sure. Um, so, so for that particular panel that, that, we're, we're, that we're doing, and um, Abe Wolf and Mark Goldfried, uh, Franz Kaspar, uh, Tim Anderson, they're also involved in the panel. And, and this is part of a, a, a book that's, that's been edited by Louis Castingay and Clara Hill, you know, on this, this issue of therapist effects. And so um, how do, you know, what do we mean? You know, how do we define a therapist effect? Uh, what do we know about the therapist effects and, and, and what are the implications? And that was really our contribution. Um, you know, Mike Constantino and Louis, David Krauss and others, we've collaborated on, on a chapter really focusing in on those, those implications. And so, I mean, I think at a basic level, we're, we're not talking about something that is all that controversial in my view, you know, because I, I think that, um, you know, quite naturally, right. We, I, I think it's, um, it would be it would be difficult to find somebody if you ask them. You know, do you do you think that there are differences between dentists? Do you think that there are differences between surgeons? You know, have you ever had an instructor who who was particularly good, or or not so good, who was less helpful? That there that there's a there's a distribution here. There's a normal distribution in terms of. Um, you know, effectiveness being defined by, say, uh, outcomes, you know, symptom functioning, well-being, quality of life outcomes, uh, or, or behaviors. And so, you know, pick your, uh, you know, model and the set of interventions that tend to be associated with that model, whether or not somebody's able to actually, you know, follow that framework in a consistent way that's useful. Uh, there are also going to be differences there. So, so I think the basic notion that there are likely to be differences between therapists is, is really not all that controversial. Uh -huh. I mean, I think that it's, um, you know, I think that in order to study it rigorously, uh, it does require, um, you know, a good amount of information. You know, it does require relatively large samples uh, of therapists, of, of clients, um, and then often repeated, repeated measurements, you know. Uh, and so I think that where, where there's maybe it's, it's almost the case that, you know, in my view, you know, that, that the basic um, uh, conjecture that these therapist differences are meaningful, they exist and they're meaningful, is not so controversial. I think people sometimes get wrapped up in the statistical piece of it uh -huh. and, 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 and think that maybe it's because it's so statistical, it's essentially an artifact, which is just, just not the case. But, but in our... Um, 
you know, in our in our particular uh, chapter and in, in what we'll be presenting at CEPI, and I don't want to don't want to give it away. <laughs> um, Just a, a, a tease. Yeah. So 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 we're working from the perspective that um, we you know these therapist differences do exist. Uh, they are they are meaningful. Uh, and and we've done some recent work uh, along with David Krauss. We published a paper in Journal of um, Consulting and Clinical Psychology. Um, where we, uh, and this is actually indirectly supported by other research that's been published too by, by Bruce Wampold and, and, and others, but um, you know, demonstrating that, that these therapist, these relative therapist differences um, are, are stable over time. So, so a key question is, are these, if we can identify what these differences are, you know, are they stable? Do they have some predictive validity to them? Meaning that if we were to, you know, identify somebody as being particularly effective for this problem area or in general, and we could throw in any, we could we could say particularly good at developing a good working, uh, a positive working alliance, whatever the construct of interest is, and and it seems like in a in a, what we're defining as a critical mass of, of clients, we've established this. Does it hold up if we look at a different at a subsequent sample, right? Mm -hmm. And so, essentially, that's what we found is that, is that there were there was a high degree of correlation, consistency. Um, yeah, consistency uh, over time uh, in terms of the the average effectiveness in a caseload for for certain types of, of therapists. Um, and uh, it's also important to note too that you know in, in doing this work, uh, we've done. Um, you know, we've done a pretty deep dive into uh, health services research in, in, in the public health world, too, you know, talking about their, you know, they're wrestling with the same issues when it comes to physicians, yeah. you know, physicians and, and differences between hospitals and, and, and how do you make use of this information in a way that's fair and useful, right? And so when you think about, well, if it is the case that these differences are meaningful and that they're valid, mm -hmm. you know, how do you, you know, what's the next step and, 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 and what are the implications of that that aren't going to unfairly, um, uh, you know, unfairly punish therapists. But then also, I mean, I think the, the, the real potential implication of getting it wrong is that, is that the idea would be that if we can harness therapist information, uh, performance, um, you know, in any category you might prioritize. Um, if, if we're getting it wrong, then, then the clients aren't going to benefit. <laughs> I mean, I think that the idea is that, is that we want to make sure that we're identifying, you know, the, the, the right information and, and, and we're doing it in a, in a rigorous way that, that has validity to it, that has consistency to it. Um, cause that's the only way in which, it's going to actually result in better better outcomes. Yeah. Yeah. And, 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 and I guess I'm putting the cart before the horse a little bit because because that's that's one place where we focus our, our attention in, in that chapter and in, in the talk will be, uh -huh. you know, if, if these differences exist, if they're stable, then then we need to really start thinking hard about what the implications are. Uh, and, you know, especially if there is, and, and, and Zach Emmel's done some work uh, doing some simulation studies to show, like, like over time at, at more of a population level, yeah. what are the real implications of, of therapists who are consistently demonstrating a negative negative outcomes? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I, I think that we we it's we're we're past due for being for having discussions about well, what are we going to do with this information? Mm -hmm. Um, you know, and, and I think that it's, you know, there are some general themes in, in, in what we, what we will be talking about too, that are, that are critical because this is complex. I mean, what, one, one theme is that we want to be able to account for patient differences, uh, because this notion of risk adjustment is really important. You want to be able to compare apples and apples, not apples and oranges, right? When you're making decisions. Another reality is that most of what we know is based on um, uh, routine outcome data, really focused on symptoms and, and, and functioning, well-being. Um, is are those the best things to be focusing on? I mean, are there other constructs? Are there other types of outcomes that we should be prioritizing equally? Um, uh, you know, and, and getting back to you know the discussion about integration. I mean, there are certain models that 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 will prioritize symptom reduction over others. And so and even within particular models, are there certain 
types of outcomes or processes that we would want to prioritize when we're thinking about relative therapist effectiveness impact you know um and then the other theme is is that we uh you know th this is necessarily a a multiple stakeholder problem you know that that um and and we like to think about it uh you know as though we're as as psychotherapists ourselves and psychotherapy researchers i think it's important for us to, to quote unquote get a get ahead of the, the, the potential policy implications that, that, that may be instituted by, by systems, individuals, yeah. uh, without, you know, sufficient, you know, background knowledge or information. Yeah. And, and I think in general, at least in the United States, there, there is this tendency to push policy ahead of really rigorously testing that yeah. policy. Yeah. And so, um, it, it's really important for us uh, you know, as therapists, as researchers, uh, including patients, including, um, you know, healthcare system broadly, that everybody be involved in these discussions. Mm -hmm. um, and so, and so, yeah, we're really thinking about you know, the, the different implications of that information, um, coming up with better methods for, for actually measuring these things, and analyzing these things, but also the very practical implications of what do we do with that. It, it connects it's beautifully with your interest in input, how to best implement the research into practice in a way. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh -huh. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and so, yeah. Since we're drawing to a close, I would be curious still to ask you, what are you working on now? What's exciting to you now? That's a good question. So I... So my, my lab here, we're actually involved in a lot of different things. And I, and I, uh, you know, we, we, we are presently doing, um, you know, several process related studies, uh, that I won't go into, but, but, but we've continued to, and this has been the case in my, you know, in my careers that had these two paths that occasionally will intersect, but not necessarily. <laughs> and, 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 and one is the more traditional psychotherapy process outcome research. And then the other has really been this more systems level uh, routine outcome monitoring uh, work um, related to the therapist effects and, and, and decision making at more of that systems level. And, and, I, and frankly, in, in recent years, uh, that's when I'm not sleeping at night <laughs> or, or on a run trying to you know, come up with some ideas. It's, it's, my brain is more fixated on the, on the systems uh -huh. uh, level work right now. Uh -huh. um, so we just completed a, um, a study that was funded by the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation here uh, where we took this issue of therapist performance and, and, and looking at other areas of healthcare where they actually are, say, publishing hospital rankings and surgeon rankings and sort of this direct-to-consumer publishing of performance information. And the research is very mixed in healthcare generally. It's not clear that it actually contributes to better, to better client outcomes. Mm -hmm. um, and went to identify patients themselves to ask them, so this is happening right now. <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 and health systems are actually wanting to move on this notion of, of quality assessment and performance assessment. And if it, let's assume that, that we have these provider level report cards in addition to other types of information about your treatment, what are your attitudes toward that information? Mm -hmm. you know, so if we were to be, if we were, if you showed up at your community mental health center and, and, and rather than just get assigned to the, again, I'm talking about the United States here, rather than just get assigned to the next therapist who's available on a Tuesday, mm -hmm. which happens to work best for you, is there a more informed way of directing you towards somebody who would be a better fit? Yeah. And, 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 and better fit, of course, talks about preferences, which, which are always going to be multidimensional. Yeah. But we wanted to get a general attitudes toward performance information. And then also uh, compare performance information to um, other characteristics of therapists or, or treatment factors. Yeah. And Bruce Wampold actually brought an article to my attention that was published in Journal of Counseling Psychology back in the early 90s, where they, they did a really elegant um, experiment where they act, where they manipulated the, the uh, it was actually focused on, on sex roles, but where they manipulated information about different types of therapists. And um, they were interested in whether or not people, whether or not you were more masculine or 
feminine on, on these dimensions, given this vignette about a particular therapist, would you be more likely to choose a female therapist or a male therapist or a stereotypically masculine therapist or feminine therapist? But their, their sort of control comparison was that they would vary the effectiveness of the, of the therapist. Uh -huh. and so you had that, that, that being different. You know, and the only consistent finding that they, found, what, that they had was that um, people in general always preferred the more effective therapist. Uh -huh. So we're getting at some of that, you know, so, so if you could see a therapist who's been demonstrated to be very, you know, uh, to work really well with individuals who are primarily depressed, which is the primary that you're coming in, we could assign you to that person, or we could assign you to somebody who's of the same gender, yeah. you know, or um, the same ethnic background or who costs less. Yeah, yeah. You know? um, and, and so we're actually just analyzing the data right now. <clears throat> and so we ended up with a, you know, we're using a survey methodology uh, in addition to, to semi-structured interviews that we're analyzing qualitatively, we also conducted a number of focus groups. And these are all community mental health center, center patients in, in the Northeast uh, U.S. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, we're hoping to get, you know, a better sense of, uh, you know, what do the clients themselves make of this uh, therapist performance information? Do they value it? Mm -hmm. uh, similar to the Wampold results, would they, would they sort of, relatively speaking, place more value on performance information compared to other characteristics of the treatment. And that actually leads right into uh, a randomized clinical trial that, that we're doing right now with Mike Constantino uh, it is, is the prime uh, principal investigator and I'm a co-PI on the grant along with David Krauss um, at, at Outcome Referrals. And what we're actually doing is we're testing this um, this hypothesis that um, you know, if, if patients seem to value, and all the data that we've collected, as we're still analyzing it, but, but the message is pretty clear. Uh, the clients want access to this information. They want to know <laughs> that it's being used at some level in, in their care decision making. That's yeah. pretty And so if clients value it and they believe that it would be helpful to them, yeah. um, and we can identify these relatively stable differences between providers mm -hmm. um, at a systems level, what is, what is the potential uh, comparative effectiveness mm -hmm. of randomizing people to see a predetermined well-matched therapist versus a therapist at, at somewhat at random. So yeah. basically based on routine uh, uh, administrative practice, yeah. so, so, which tends to be who's available on a Tuesday. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, and so we're, I mean, that study is underway, um, you know, and, and so stay tuned for, for those. Exactly. Results. But, but I'm, yeah, so this is just a, a long way of saying that I, um, you know, in, in conducting this research and, and speaking more with, with clients and the clients that we're focusing on here tend to be the, the pretty under-resourced individuals. Yeah. Um, they tend to not have a lot of power or control or agency when it comes to their therapy. They tend to be, um, uh, you know, their voices tend to be silent in the published literature, mm -hmm. you know, that, um, you know, the more I'm convinced that from a public health perspective, at least in the United States, um, you know, we can really do a lot, uh, I, I think to improve the systems by engaging in this practice oriented research, doing it in a way that's collaborative that prizes the patient's perspective mm -hmm. um, and developing better methods for harnessing this this vast amount of information that we're collecting you know what do we do with that information yeah. you know and working together to, to to use it in a way that's actually going to benefit you know individual clients but then also at that at a, at a population yeah. level will also benefit communities you know um and so yeah i'm moving Great. much yeah. more macro level <laughs> but one uh, trend is yeah one trend is clearly the giving away some control to the client itself it's actually reminding me a little bit of the recent interest of john Norcross, also focusing on client preferences and matching mm -hmm. client characteristics and i'm really happy that you're trying to think of it also at the systems level because it does seem that if no one does that then it's the policy who implements these kind of decisions so and it's also a little, it's another one of these, I don't know if it's a paradox, but it's, a, it's another, um, you know, the irony is that in order to maximize personalization, it requires 
examining things at these different levels, sure. including at the other systems level. Yeah. Um, <laughs> including the studying the responsiveness. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Well, James, I'd like to finish off with one last question I've been asking all of our colleagues, which is basically what advice would you wish to have received when you were starting out your career as a researcher and therapist? Hmm. Wish to have received. It's a good question. I mean, I, I, I think that the, maybe I'll work around to it without <laughs> just, just, you know, Blab, blabbing on and, and, and actually answer a slightly different question, <laughs> which is I think that the potentially the most useful piece of advice that I've received was um, uh, to never never give up or get too, too demoralized. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm talking primarily from a research perspective here. Okay. That um, uh, Publishing is difficult. You will get hard feedback. <laughs> Sometimes be, be critical. Not every grant. In fact, the vast majority of your grant applications will not be funded. Uh, take that feedback um, in the way that it's intended. Um, you know, spend the next 48 hours, if it's a grant that's really important to you, maybe the next two weeks, <laughs> um, you know, screaming and, and cursing and it, <laughs> Know, becoming somewhat, you know, depressed, uh, but then, <laughs> but, but then go back to it, and and and, and gracefully and, applying the feedback. Well, usually there's usually when you come back to it once you've cooled down, the feedback is 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 useful. Yeah. You know, they can actually see that there's something valuable about it. Um, you know, and so yeah, I think that that's been really important to me is to just not. You know, uh, you know, science is it's it's incremental. It's it's slow. Um, uh, don't get sort of discouraged. Don't over. Um, uh, yeah. So don't 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 let these things sort of get you down. You know, just keep working and, and trying to solve the problems that you've um, that you value that you think are important. You know. Um, it's actually it's, very useful advice for the clinical setting also, including the harsh feedback we might get from a client. Yeah, absolutely, from a client, even potentially from a supervisor. I mean, I think, you know, feedback in general, you know, again, it's quite, comes somewhat full circle because, uh, you know, the, the outcome monitoring and, and the performance information that, that we're collecting and researching, it does come back to feed, you know, it comes down to feedback. You yeah. know, are, are you able to... Um, you know, take in information, you know, and, and, and make use of it, you know, assimilation, accommodation, <laughs> the classic. Like, do I not, don't get worked up about the thing that I, that's potentially unfair or, or, you know, but, but, but take, take what's useful from it and, and, and move forward. Um, and, and I mean, beyond that, I mean, there, I mean, I think that's the main thing that comes to mind. I mean, I, I've been, I've been incredibly fortunate and partly why I'm punting on your question or changing the, the, my, my answer um, is that uh, you know I've just been incredibly fortunate to have to, to be mentored by people who are um, you know extremely supportive and knowledgeable and um, you know really gave me excellent advice and guidance over the years. Uh, you know Louis Cassengaze you know continues to be you know one of the most important people in my life. You know and so uh, like I you know he basically he he's guided me well. You know, so. <laughs> um, and also somebody who gave me that advice, you know, and it was you know, because when we would submit papers or submit a grant and it didn't get funded, you know, together we would commiserate and go talk. <laughs> we, what do we do now? You yeah. know, how are we going to respond to this? After the wine uh, drinking, then back. After the wine drinking, you know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. James, thank you so much for the opportunity. Yeah. No, thank you for inviting me. This was fun. <laughs>